All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. I am Jamie Marshall. I'm the executive director of St. Louis Park Friends of the Arts, and we are really excited to have everyone tuning in to this virtual poetry reading featuring some great local poets who we will introduce shortly. While we are all staying home and doing our part to slow the spread of this virus, we are also committed to our mission to support artists and to build community through the arts in St. Louis Park. So in addition to this reading here tonight, um, we're also hosting a virtual open mic poetry, poetry jam on April 7th. We're doing weekly artist happy hours on Fridays at four o'clock, um, just to try to stay connected in these times and have places to share our creativity with other local artists. Um, so you can find all that info on our website, and our Facebook page. Um, so tonight, uh, as we hear from these poets, I know that we have not done a virtual event like this before, so bear with us if there are any um, unexpected friends that pop into screens or whatever might occur. Um, but without further ado, I'll introduce our community poet in St. Louis Park, Diane Pecoraro. She was named community poet in 2010 as a part of the Our Town Verses and Voices event. And since then, Diane has been involved in a ton of poetry initiatives. She's helped to create collective community poems. She's curated poems for our city school calendar, hosted a lot of open mic poetry jams, written poetry for our e-newsletter. I'm sure there's more that I'm forgetting right now, but welcome Diane uh, and thank you. Well, hello everybody out there in our real audience while we do this virtually. Um, I'm really happy to do this in honor of National Poetry Month, which starts April 1st. And tonight we have three really fine poets who will be reading, who have some connection to St. Louis Park. One of us came with our family and moved here when we were in grade school. One of us came when um, we, we moved here and have enjoyed being in St. Louis Park all our adult life. And I, one of the readers, had came here in the 1970s because I heard that I could get a good bagel here. I came from New York and that was something I missed, frankly. So each of us has experienced the city and the community in a different way. And that probably has influenced our writing advertently or inadvertently. So we've been insiders here and outsiders all at the same time and at different times. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the speakers in the following order. The first speaker will be Deborah Stone, who, is, who will give you a little bit about her background. The second reader will be Mary Kane, who has recently published a book. And the third reader will be me. And we'll each introduce ourselves after we finish our reading. We'll each read for about 10 minutes and read five, six poems. It depends on what everybody has in their store. And so we're about to begin. So I'm really happy to introduce Mary Kane. Hi, thank you, Diane. Yep, I'm Mary Christine Kane. I am um, happy to be here. Thank you, St. Louis Park Friends of the Arts for sponsoring this and continuing to support the arts in St. Louis Park. I, um, yep, I lived here most of my adult life, usually with a foster cat or two. I recently published this book, Between the Stars Where You Are Lost, and I'm gonna read a few from there and a few from um, that were not in the book. So my first poem is called um, To the Collector. A small pile of rings bought from toy machines for the thrill of placing the quarter in the slot where it fits just right. The click, click, click as she turns the silver handle with her hand that is soft as a pillow and listens, breath held quiet as a cloud as the bubble drops down the tunnel to the dispenser where her palm waits. She pulls apart the plastic container and finds either joy or disappointment. 
The plastic jewels are worn for special occasions and must be removed before going potty, as is the house rule, on account of how loose they are and prone to dangling. And mother does not want to fish any more out of the bowl. There is always a need for another quarter. Um, and the next one, I was just thinking about all the families at home, probably a lot more than normal. And one of my favorite memories of being a child was on Sunday nights, like all the kids would play on the block and then you'd have to go home in time for the Disney show that was on on Sunday night. And at the time we didn't have um, the digital TVs yet. We just had like, we had a black and white with antennas and you had to like, get them just right so that you could get the reception in. And sometimes you have to move where you sat in the room just so to not to disturb the reception. So for younger people, you probably wouldn't get that reference, but that's what it's talking about at the beginning of this poem. Sunday Night Disney. David clicks the big round button on, adjusts the tall metal ears, tells me to move a little to the right, a little more. Black zigzags flatten, bounce up, down, fade out. Tinkerbell flies in, waves her black wand, leaves a trail of stars. Against my hand, a furry nudge as Abby settles in. David crunches cheese curls, mouth open, washes it down with cream soda. Our friend Mickey squeaks, then Minnie, with their round noses, round ears, round camper. We think they can see us. We don't hear crunching or purring or mom puttering. David's shirt is littered with orange crumbs. The whole block of kids share our stupor. Before bed, we wish on our favorite stars. I vow not to fall from my bed like Peter Pan or get lost like Dorothy. We close our eyes and fall deep into sleep. Um, these, um, on a less light note, these are the instructions on my, upon my death. <laughs> um, but you'll see they're really not morbid. Instructions. Don't trouble yourself with the plaque in a park, a metal ornament you visit with ribbons at Christmas, daisies for my birthday. You have loved me each of my waking days. That will always be enough. Bury me naked, please. Wrap me in cool dirt. Let me dissolve in the slipstream. Finally, I could flow in the Niagara, drop over the falls barrelless before all the tourists with their cameras, rise in the clouds children dream upon from back seats of cars. I want to be sand, carpet of the cosmos. Take a handful of me in your palm. I will tell you stories of creation. Don't bother with my name, my lineage. Call me humankind and let me sink until I touch Pelosaurus bone, smell sulfur from years of living. Um, this one's called Dear Universe. Dear universe, why? We will work our entire lives building towers of intention, full of compassion. Is it just one brick removed for the blinding dust of crash? I say universe, is it our towers or those recalcitrant bricks? Is it so we can awaken to the magnificent sound of destruction so we can again feel the rough, dried mud, the pleasure of building with many hands. Um, you know, I was thinking of childhood and a lot of my book is really is about um, childhood and there's a complicated experience, a complicated experience of childhood, uh, how sometimes it's, fun and light and beautiful and it's Disney and you fall asleep and other times it's painful and, and adults 
brush you off and say get over it and and um that kids are you know full 100 percent human beings with full 100 percent emotion so it's um tries my book tries to honor that but the next book poem i'm going to read is actually a breakup poem <laughs> but i was thinking of um golden books does appear in here so i felt a little bit related to me it's my uh golden book breakup poem a summer tale from the hilltop, it seemed, she could choose their plot of life together. Any square, green square she wanted, the sun would warm and make lovely. A page from a golden book, swollen green hills curving into valleys, puffy cottages like snow whites, settled in as if they had grown there. As their eyes followed a distant couple on horseback, their cloud talk ventured to a future. It was easy for her to say yes that day, the veils plump with dreaming. No would have been a hostile thunder, a wicked girl with large feet, beheading a frog, dribbling blood on sugar. No, the princess lying unloved for another century. In the winding path back, her hand in his, she walked further into an ancient desire to believe stepping gingerly as a royal might. It was the wind's chant that made her say, hold me, wanting to mean forever. Months later, she found the courage to say, never, ever, ever, never, no, never, the end. Um, I'm gonna read one more. I wrote this one after my grandma died. I was really, really close to her and it took, I wrote a lot, a lot of poems to, to deal with that loss. And um, I was walking around Cedar Lake one day and I just saw a dog that reminded me of my grandma's dog. And I just realized I didn't have a picture of that, of her with her little dog. And I, I was sad about it. And I, um, it's just a really good reminder for me you know, that it's like it says in here, it's the plain things we'll long for. You know, we used to always take pictures when, you know, grandma was in her royal blue suit with her lipstick and, you know, I had some of my little Easter dress or whatever, like we were dressed up. Um, those were our pictures. We're all, you know, in these awkward poses, smiling. But it really, you know, what I would love to have right now, like a picture of us around the table playing garbage poker and drinking seven up you know like that's the stuff that really after she died i realized is what was really meaningful to me so it's just a reminder for all of us to just think about the everyday things that we forget to be grateful for and to cherish and to and remember what we need pictures of the plain things today i wanted just a picture of you with your squat dog in that bright orange sweater, you crocheted for her so her little white body wouldn't get lost in piles of buffalo snow. I remembered it is the plain things we will long for. The bowl with the gold scalloped edges, pastel flowers at bottom, ladled full of soup. Your purse stocked with gum, crackers, rosaries, I wanted just a picture, you planting tomatoes in that thin strip of dirt lining your driveway, moss kerchief fluttering, you stirring sauce with the burnt edge wooden spoon, you crocheting at the parlor, curious dog by your feet, you scurrying to the door, fuzzy slippers scraping linoleum to welcome us in. Thank you again for tuning in and listening and supporting poetry. And I will turn it over to Deborah Stone. Thank you, Mary. Like Mary, I write about family. I write about the environment. I write about the neighborhoods I lived in, the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul and St. Louis Park where I grew up and where I had family. Uh, the first note, but the first poem I'm going to read 
to you is called Snow, an autobiographical poem. Snow intentionally floats into her raised arms onto open lips and tongue, tasting like ice cream. She, a descendant of the Ibu, Ojibwe Irish, born at St. Joseph Hospital, she wants to catch the black muskrat scampering along the banks of Bassett Creek, wood waste bobbing in the creek from silent sawmills. From the bank, she tries to fish out the wood for a trap and struggles, one step at a time, sinking into the downy snow, leaving behind a zigging, zagging pattern that quickly disappears as the wind scatters crystal snowflakes. She likes the snow crunching under her feet, feet big as grandma's. It snows nine months out of 12, her people no snow. They were once farmers, ranchers, breaking horses and mules, li living on the arid sand hills of Nebraska, then leaving for Minnesota, for freedom, fortune, working on railroads, creating another life, a house with a parlor, a green Davenport with thread threadbare arms covered with cream colored doilies. Rondo and Victoria was their home until I-94 tore through. Her mother married a boy from the North side, a tangled neighborhood of Jews, Norwegians, Finns, Germans, Negroes, Indians, Mexicans. Hordes of rainbow children making joyous noise along the banks of Bassett Creek. Mangled rubber tires, sharp edges of tin and broken glass glisten in the muddy bottom, waiting for summer toes. My next poem is called A Poem Story. After the divorce, she married the young niece of her ex-husband, you know? The one they raised like a daughter. The ex-husband took up the drink to mend his broken heart. The next poem I'm going to read for you, for you this evening is about a garden. Garlene's Garden, a sonnet. She plants basil by the entrance for good luck, thyme, sage, mint in tiny pots. Hollowed out gourds hang on forked sticks stuck in the earth edge, the garden path, and bring good spirits and protection. She says, pick those baby lima beans, butter beans, ripened corn, the large bell pepper that's ready to drop. Dig up few onions and get the green beans before the rabbits feast on them. She cuts up all those vegetables, shucks the corn, puts it all in the saucepan. Adds a stick of butter, a cup of milk, and simmers till the vegetables are tender, about 10 minutes on low heat. Mix it well. Then feed the ancestors first leave a small portion of succotash in the good bowl on the ground, she says. This poem I'm going to read to you next is, is for a dear friend of mine who passed away recently and was 94 years young. And he was a wonderful gardener and he was from South Carolina. So this is dedicated to Ed and his granddaughter, Roberta. I am stardust. I should also say Joni Mitchell had a hand in this too. I am stardust. I asked him, where are you going? He said, I am stardust. I am golden. I am on my way back to the garden. Yes, your collards waving, hello. Cabbage, lettuce, tomatoes, big as two of your hands, together. Sweet peas, kale, squash, peppers, corn, and butterflies float on by. You will sprinkle them all with your stardust. 
when you get back to your garden, forever sitting in your lawn chair, for you are now golden. At one point in my life, I did live in Senegal, West Africa, and this poem inspired that. Swimming the Sahil, between twilight hours of sleep and awake, I'm an African princess swimming the Sahil. Sand stings my cheeks, sun scorches off my sapphires, rubies, and emeralds. I stand naked in these desert dunes, always left naked, body and soul uncovered. The world cannot see me, only a Tuareg horseman in flowing indigo robes. A sharp toenail caresses my ankle. Husband says, wake up, turn over. You're talking in your sleep again. I'm returned to myself flannel nightgown twisted around my thighs, bedroom chilled with autumn, boxer and Pomeranian eyes sending telegraphic messages, let us out human, bare feet touch a cold floor, I feel the grains of sand. And my last poem is about something I really enjoy doing here in Minnesota and we have many beautiful state parks to enjoy camping. Camping. Remember how the lightning bugs darted in the dusk of dark bushes like Christmas lights they twinkled on and off? The day, hot and sticky, we cooled off in the Whitewater River. So shallow, more like a creek, the water lapped around my ankles your thighs as you sat on a protruding rock, our dogs waiting too, grateful no longer harassed by biting black night gnats. We forgot our troubled world and watch cloud patterns remind us of childhood summers, long play days coming home for dinner, then out again racing home as street lights began to glow. In our trailer, we held each other close, listening to the songs of cicadas and crickets as we fell asleep in the woods. We must always remember to love each other all the time and like each other most of the time. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce you to Diane and she will read for you this evening Take it away, Diane. Thanks, Deborah. So I have some poems that are a variety, about a variety of things. One of them is about family. And I'll just start with the a first one, which is called Power Outage. And it was written during a power outage that we had here in St. Louis Park not so long ago, that Many times I'm intrigued by how people deal with different circumstances. For example, the one that we're in now. So this was written for uh, a, a couple who I became very friendly with and they were from Cambodia. From Cambodia, power outage. When the power went out, it stayed out for days. We complained and plotted too. Commonalities became questions how to brew a cup of coffee, look pressed and dressed for work. We calculated inconvenience like colored beads on a large abacus. Imposed dimness made little difference to you in this country for two months, plant transplanted from a rural village in Cambodia where wrinkles and a close shave were small matters next to hauling the water every day your struggle here, among many others, was function, a blender, for example, pronouncing refrigerator more daunting than remembering what to put in it. A bold wind with down branches, simply another quirk of the electrical world. I always wonder what you wonder, your face trained for repose, your muscles held in check while hours ever charged 
twitch with each flicker that crosses an endless array of westernized screens. This time, it was about power. When the wires went down, you knew exactly what to do. The next poem is called Car Rental, Skipping Valencia. And this poem is about a street, oh, an actually very long street in Arizona and Tucson called Valencia, for which I have a special fondness. Car Rental, Skipping Valencia. Hop on the I-10, he says. It's a quick exit right outside the airport. Skip Valencia. It's 12 stoplights to the freeway. Yeah, 12 stoplights would slow a person down. So would the bodegas and Burger Kings, the occasional show of desert scrub, the car washes, and run-down strip malls along the way. His job is speedy service. His handheld device feeds him instant data. Valencia is not in the order. Valencia is a slow float. Valencia is a turtle. Valencia ticks off at 30 miles per hour. He's pushing 75. Vehicle is ready. Renter is ready. The roads are mapped efficiently. He hands over the keys. His words are heard, but not heeded. Hard to bypass, bypass the lure of conchas from the Mexican bakery just off the strip. I wonder if he has ever tasted the pink sugar sprinkled on the plump sweet bread and dipped a corner in his dark morning coffee. This poem is perfect for today, which is a dreary, cold, wet, early spring day. It's called Dreaming Virus Virescent. And I saw the word virescent, which means green, and one of my word a day feeds. So it's spurred this poem, Dreaming Virescent. The cold spring rain lingers for days. It is a dose of yellow we crave, lemon, chartreuse, butter. In a yard on the corner, a scrawny forsythia bush, bush filigreed and feisty, shines its madcap blaze on the wet street. An incandescent spectacle, it diverts our glance from the somber branches of neighboring trees, struggling to birth new buds, yearning for festive leafy patterns. This beacon on the corner, this slash of gold against moody gray. And now for a change of pace, I just wrote this today. I've been trying to be um, keeping a poem a day about the coronavirus and my life inside and things that I glean from others in conversations. So this one, meant to be silly, I hope it is, is called Hair. Um, and as I said, it's not quite done, but it's fun to read something that's not finished. When we're all let out of this lair, what will be the state of our hair? With barber and beauty shops shuttered up tight, you can bet that soon we'll all look a fright. An inch a month, some grow more. No barber to wield, clippers number four. The curlies will do their own dance untamed. The straights will stick out or down like horse mane. Folks who die will have wide parts of gray, wishing for a stylist to cover it away. Kids with top tufts will lose their fanfare when those shaved sides are no longer bare. The stylish baldies will grow out stubble. Their way cool look gone to the rubble. Will we begin to barber in place, cut our own locks in our own private space? Will friends with skills take a snip, invent a new style with a clip? For sure, adults and children all about will be in this awkward stage of growing out. <laughs> and there you have it, what poets do on rainy days in St. Louis Park during a coronavirus. The next poem is a fairly recent poem called La Cucaracha. And it's written to a cockroach. And when I read it to another poet, she said, oh, it's a love poem to a cockroach. 
think about it any way you want. <laughs> La cucaracha, which means, of course, the cockroach. You handsome mahogany fellow, so still on a stucco wall outside the restaurant, where, to my amazement, the comers and goers stop to admire you, and no one attempts to do you in. Your species is famous for its surprise appearances, but no darting here, you are fully at rest. The spraying, pruning, sweeping, and sanitizing performed daily have not deterred you, brazen survivor, no doubt here since the Mayans. How did you get into this resort, gated from the nearby rougher neighborhood as it is? Mounds of wasted food entice, better than vying with roaming dogs for the pickings on the street where limes and eggs are left to molder on the curb. We stare, and no one takes a swipe. Your presence is regal. In our all-inclusive, you are another sunbather. Tourists hum la cucaracha and point. One woman says, ick. My advice, seek a crevice and flee. Egalitarian sensibilities will last just so long at these prices. The next poem is about my sister, who does live in Tucson, by the way. And it was part of a project called Wisdom. It was a part of an art lab project for the Jewish Community Center here, which hosts an artist lab project. And what I did for this project was to take old pieces of wisdom from proverbs and sayings and question them. And so this was called Questioning the Ancestors Three. And the, the proverb was, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I am into prevention, my sister into cure. She sees pleasure, I anticipate peril. When I put plans on paper, she scoffs at lists. Years have hardened these old patterns. We parse them with curiosity, divinations of the sister sort, tracing what nature gave each of us, inspecting the fossils of our family line. I am what I am and that's all I am, our mother always said, quoting Popeye, when we charged her with some minor misdemeanor. And so we are what we are. But we wonder as we stack up our choices, which sister weighs wiser, the one who scrimped or the one who spent? Ah, wisdom, a moving target. And the last one is a rhyme I wrote a long time ago. And today I pulled it out because my mother always said, man plans and God laughs. Some of you may know. My mother had proverbs for everything, but man plans and God laughs. And so the name of this is A Case of Just in Case. Modern armor goes like this against the vagaries of chance. Wouldn't want anything to go am amiss. One assumes a defensive stance. It's just in case, cover the bases, keep risk, discomfort at bay. Important to hold options and aces to control each step of the way. Why else carry a portable phone, bottled water, a Walkman CD, a book so you won't feel alone, sunglasses, an extra house key. Throw in mace, a pocket knife, that does at least nine things. As fear and violence become more rife, attach new and dangerous strings. Fantasy spawns deep storms of cold, thunder, and thirst. We conjure more complex forms of protection against the worst. And I think we would all agree that we have not found the protection. So, Thank you all for listening and participating in our virtual poetry reading. And now we thought we'd turn it over to Jamie, who will lead a discussion with all of us. Jamie. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, um, just a couple of questions for each of you um, so we can learn a little more about 
your process and inspiration. So this first question I'll ask for each of you to answer, um, starting with you, Mary. Um, who are some of your favorite po poets um, who inspire you or what, what sources um, do you turn to for inspiration of your writing? Um, favorite poets, lovely young Lee. Um, I love how dreamy and spiritual he is and how honest it, it, or it just seems how true his work is to, I don't know what I think is true in the world. Uh, Tony Hovland, really like Ralph Angel too. I, when I, but I, when I think about my inspirations, I usually like think more about music and how that's inspired me. I've always been really, um, gotten obsessed about with songs and you know Deborah mentioned Joni Mitchell and I love to I love all the folk songs and I love that you can um with just a few words you know placed in the right way you can really say something really big so so I always find inspiration when I go to concerts and um and a lot of times when I'm driving in the car and I'm listening to a song sometimes I end up recording thoughts for a poem. Thanks. Deborah. how about you? Any sources of inspiration um, or, or favorite poets? Um, I do have some favorite poets. Uh, Camille Dungy. I've always been intrigued by her work. She looks at very many things that, in, that inspire women, uh, motherhood, family, uh, the environment. She worked. She she's done an anthology about black poets writing about nature. Um, Ross Gay also is one of my favorite poets. Um, his poetry book uh, recently called um, what is it called? Uh, it's kind of book of of uh, delights where he took just ordinary things that impact us every day. And he did that uh, every day, just about every day he wrote about. Um, Terrence Hayes and Jericho Brown, I enjoy their work. They, they're interested in experimenting with the forms of poetry, taking especially Terrence Hayes, who's worked with the sonnet and has done some incredibly different things with it. I'm also um, inspired by film, uh, looking at different documentary films and how they could influence my work, um, going to museums and looking at paintings, sculpture work. Um, they have also inspired my work and just taking a walk along Theodore Worth Parkway inspires my work. So. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Diane, same question to you, poets or sources of inspiration? I'm only gonna say one, even though I have a little bit of a list, and that's Stephen Sondheim, the lyricist, who has continued to knock my socks off for a very long time, and I always said I would like to go study with Stephen Sondheim. This has never happened yet, or at least not yet, but he has really, his lyrics really excite me on a lot of levels for their depth and ingenuity and word manipulation. Um, I very much like Lucille Clifton, who, is, who, who, who writes very simply, but very eloquently. And I like Lewis Jenkins, a Minnesota pe art, uh, poet who does prose poetry and who died recently, very compelling. And um, there are many, there are many. I like George Bill Geard from Cleveland because he's funny. I love funny poetry and it's a, not always easy to find or witty poetry. So those are some of my favorites. Yeah. yeah, you all spoke about drawing inspiration from other forms of art too, which I always find interesting and common. And I'm sure that many uh, musicians and uh, filmmakers and artists draw their inspiration from poetry as well. So works in both directions. Um, one other question that well, I'll ask, um, and I think we'll leave it here, um, but in this moment in time with um, all that's going on, how 
has your own writing process or the work that you're putting out been affected by this current situation? Or, you know, we've only kind of been in this moment for a short period of time. What, what role have you seen poetry take more generally amidst this global pandemic? Um, and maybe I will uh, start with you this time, Diane. Well, we're all locked in the house and some of us are working on, on work. And some of us who are not engaged in that way may have more time to write. In my own case, what happened was that the first week passed and I couldn't write a thing, not a thing. I was just, I couldn't even look at poems and I couldn't even look at my own poems. Um, this week I decided to take on this, this kind of silly project and see if I could hear some funny things about the coronavirus and the way people are dealing with it and try to write some kind of silly things around that. Maybe some of them will be serious ultimately, but right now I'm looking for a laugh. Yeah. And, uh, and can I just say one more thing? Deborah, um, Deborah, excuse me, Mary will be offering up some prompts to the, which, you know, is a way of dealing with writing. So I look forward to hearing what she's going to do. Yeah, Deborah, how about you? What kind of, uh, has your work been affected by this or how have you seen poetry um, in maybe a different light? Um, I have been um, a real Twitter fan lately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been looking at uh, social media and seeing what my fellow writers have been doing. Um, I'm finding that really intriguing. I have also been reading quite a bit. Um, I, actually, I'm kind of grateful for this time to be sitting down in my home and not being distracted because I'm an extrovert and I'm easily distracted. So I have enjoyed this moment where I am sitting and finally getting to that stack of books that are behind my bed and beside my bed that I, and also in my office that I need to be reading. So I'm really enjoying um, reading, getting new ideas from what other writers have been doing. So actually, I'm kind of happy. <laughs> That's fabulous. That's great. Um, Mary, how about you? Diane mentioned you might have some prompts to uh, offer up, but how, how has your work been affected or how have you seen poetry? Well, I, um, I haven't actually had a lot of time because work has been so busy. Even I'm working at home, I'm working long hours, but I do do morning pages um, every morning. And so, and that's what Julia Cameron had brought that idea that you write three pages in the morning to sort of clear your head so you can be open to write the rest of the if it comes to you later in the day and I do do that and journaling is a really great way for me to process what's happening and um, it it always is a little bit of a relief for me just to write down my thoughts and just um, all the all the little things that happen in one single day um, and, you know, I was working really hard on finishing up my next manuscript and I not wanted to touch that because I feel like the world that was three weeks ago is not, does not feel like the same world that's right now. So that's okay. It can, it can sit there for a little while. It's fine. Um, but I, I've just been struck by, you know, in my social media feeds, I do see people kind of reaching to art to, um, at this time and, I mean, I had a friend who never reads. She just told me she went to the bookstore and she bought four books, you know, um, and seeing people post poems and, and, and um, you know, quotes by famous writers. I think that it's offering us the time to daydream that a lot of us haven't had. Um, it offers like space for writing. And so I do have some prompts that I can read if people are, uh, and, and I don't think it has to be poetry, you know, it could be anything, you know, my girlfriends and I, one of, we love to do this, we get together once a year and we do collages together. So we just, you just take all your magazines and, you know, put some big plastic on the table and it's really 
meditative and, and fun. Um, but so prompts. So one of the th one things I really love to do is just thinking about strong images from the day, something that just got me. And a lot of times I start from that. Sometimes I go to the dictionary, I pick out five words and I just start, you know, writing from one of those words. It's important to remember when you're doing prompts that like it's just supposed to get you started. So like if you start writing and you go somewhere else, just go wherever you go. It's just the idea is to get started. Um, you can write a letter to somebody. You can write a letter to a celebrity, a famous person, an imaginary person, an alien. You can start a poem with, I remember, or I don't remember. A lot of times I wrote an essay once about a radish. That's one thing you can really look at the small details of your house, open your refrigerator, find something, <laughs> write about how something smells, tastes, looks, and just really study it. You know, have that meditative quality of um, just writing about an object and really trying to, you know, calm down and, and see it. Uh, we have a lot more time for that right now. And if you have kids, you know, I, I started writing as a child. I was, I, the first I remember writing about was animals. I had to write a fable and for, for school and I wrote about a horse and then I wrote extra credit about a pig, and then I, you know, and then I wrote about a cat. So, I mean, a, a fable is a really good form for younger people. You can ask, um, if, if you have a child who's maybe interested in writing, you can ask, just like give them little pieces at a time to say, either they could speak it or they could write it depending on what level they're at. But you can say, um, hey, tell me about a place I've never been to, either real or imaginary. What does it look like? You know, what does it smell like? Um, who's there? And then, you know, what's the name of the person who's there or the animal who's there? You know, and then just kind of keep opening it up. And then you can say, what if that animal went on an adventure? What do you think that animal would do, you know? And see, I don't know, see what happens. And it, and if, if nothing, you know, if they get bored and move on, that's also fine. But I, I think it's, I mean, just in, encouraging the imaginative quality uh, that writing can bring is is um, really positive right now, so, yeah. Thank you for that. And I, I think that's a great place to wrap things up. Um, so I just, again, like to thank each of you for, um, sharing your, your beautiful poems and, and wisdom uh, about your work and your inspiration. And I hope that uh, everyone watching this will tune in uh, and join us for some of these virtual events. And um, if you find yourself uh, writing poems, that's wonderful. And if not, you know, that's okay too. This is a time for everyone to um, kind of be in the space that they need to be in. So um, thank you all so much. And uh, we hope that we'll hear from you soon.